We are sick. Worldwide, we are dying from diseases that were once unheard of. Each year, roughly 10 million people die from cancer and 20 million from heart disease. Alzheimer's disease affects almost 50 million people and half a billion of us have diabetes. Less lethal, though highly relevant, 40% of men over 45 have low testosterone and 10% of women experience menstrual irregularities and infertility. All of these disorders and more have one thing in common. Each of them, to varying degrees, is caused or exacerbated by a change in the actions and levels of the hormone insulin, a condition known as insulin resistance. And you might have it. Odds are you do. It is the most common disorder worldwide, affecting roughly half of all adults in the USA. In fact, answer these questions to yourself. Do you have more fat around your belly than you think is healthy? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have high levels of blood triglycerides? Do you have patches of darker skin or small bumps of skin around your neck, armpits, or elsewhere? Diabetes mellitus is an insulin disease. In these early stages, insulin is elevated, but blood glucose is still normal, a state we know as insulin resistance. Heart disease is the leading cause of death. It encompasses numerous cardiovascular disorders, including hypertension, cardiomyopathy, and atherosclerosis. There is more than coincidence that insulin resistance is the most common disorder worldwide, and heart disease is the most common cause of death. If someone is moderately overweight and has hypertension, the person is almost assuredly insulin resistant. Through five known distinct mechanisms, insulin resistance causes pathological changes in the way the heart and blood vessels function, creating a series of unfortunate events that culminate in an elevated blood pressure and increased effort with each heart contraction. Compared with having normal insulin levels, elevated insulin increases the risk of heart disease by roughly 40 times. But what of the brain? Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia worldwide and more ubiquitous every day. <clears throat> Once again, we may be tempted to see only coincidence between the most common form of dementia and the most common health disorder. In fact, the connection between, between Alzheimer's disease and insulin resistance is so strong that many people consider Alzheimer's disease to be an extension of type 2 diabetes, occasionally called type 3 diabetes. This, of course, means at least to some degree, it's one more manifestation of insulin resistance. As the brain becomes insulin resistant, its ability to utilize glucose for fuel is diminished. As a brief aside, other neurological conditions appear to share a similarly compromised ability to use glucose as a fuel for the brain, including, to differing degrees, migraines, epilepsy, depression, and even some instances of autism. A final disorder connected with insulin is of broad interest, body fat. In 1923, Austrian physician scientist Wilhelm Falta noted, a functionally intact pancreas is necessary for fattening. He further documented that the most efficient way to fatten a human, calorie for calorie, was to include abundant amounts of food that increase insulin, which is created in the pancreas. Many scientific reports reveal that insulin therapy significantly reduces metabolic rate, accounting for as much as 30% of the fat gain. At this point, you're expecting me to give you a clear, simple solution, and here it is. We must control insulin to control metabolic health. A scientifically sound strategy to control insulin is based on adjusting macronutrients to favor sources of energy that have the smallest effect on insulin. When carbohydrate is consumed in the form of pure glucose, very similar to eating a refined starch or sugar, insulin dramatically increases to well above 10 times over normal and, depending on the person, can remain elevated for several hours. Though this can vary, when a person eats pure protein, insulin will usually increase slightly over normal levels for a time. 
Remarkably, fat consumption, in contrast, has no effect on insulin. Based on these data and dozens of related clinical studies, three conclusions have become pillars for me. One, we need to control carbohydrates. I'm not advocating the avoidance of an entire group of macronutrients. After all, carbohydrates include a remarkable range of foods. Rather, if the carbohydrate comes in a bag or a box with a barcode, it's likely one to be careful with. Of course, sugar, in its many forms and clever names, is uniquely terrible. This includes fruit juice and smoothies. If you want to control insulin and enjoy fruit, eat it. Don't drink it. Two, we should prioritize protein. A case has recently been made in scientific literature that recommendations of dietary protein are insufficient for most people to maintain and promote muscle and bone mass, which is critical for maintaining good health and insulin sensitivity throughout life. Depending on age and activity, an optimal level of dietary protein is around 1 to 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. Importantly, this need for dietary protein increases with age. As we get older, we need more protein. Three, we need to stop fearing fat. We have a strong cultural aversion to dietary fat. In fact, by many estimates, we eat a smaller portion of our diets from fat now than ever before. Dietary fat is a remarkable energy source. Because it has no effect on insulin, on its own, in a way, it has the ability to feed our bodies, but not our fat, providing a new version of an old adage, we aren't what we eat. For the second part of this process, I recommend you test what you learn. When you think you've found sufficient evidence to support an ideal lifestyle plan to fight insulin resistance and its related complications, try it for a month. Keep in mind that the changes you make will ideally be sufficiently practical to follow indefinitely. By basing a lifestyle plan on eating less and exercising more, we are ensuring an almost constant battle against hunger. And hunger usually wins. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are not spared from the plagues of prosperity, these chronic diseases that stem from insulin resistance. In fact, evidence suggests we may suffer from them more than members of other religions. Prophets and apostles have divinely interpreted the application of the word of wisdom to include avoiding a short list of habit-forming substances, but they've not gone further, nor should we. As President Packer stated, the word of wisdom has not been spelled out in more detail. May we appreciate that our bodies can be a tool to help us develop divine attributes that prepare us for eternal progression.